thanking everyone for coming and thank you Judith for having us and um, encourage people to fly around and look at the larger figures and go inside of them and we'll def yeah we'll have a spiel we'll talk more after everybody's able to explore thank you so i'm going to load in excess and uh enjoy <laughs> and of course if you have questions in the meantime you are welcome to to talk and you don't have to be quiet <laughs>
Hello, Anna. Hi. <laughs> I'm trying to find you. Uh, yeah. I haven't been. In... <laughs> I'm behind you, I think. Let me go. This, oh, there you are. Oh, hi. Yeah, this and... is so beautiful. Mm -hmm. I'm so inspired. Mm -hmm. It's a, um, such a fine line to start talking in a space like this. And what is the point when you can say, uh, <laughs> and what do you say when you start speaking? Mm -hmm. Hi, Sean. Hi, I did it. Did you get back? Okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, If if uh, if everyone had enough, to, yes, like uh, as as Kate just said, feel free to explore all the insides of the goddesses, the giant goddesses.
Uh, I I muted you, but uh, if I mute you, just please uh, feel free to unmute yourself again if you need to. I see we have a, a few uh, a few people who seem to have a hard time joining the room, and I. Uh, I hope that as I am in the streamer mode, they should be uh, should be able to see and hear what we say and uh, what I what I see. So I will try to show the place around a bit, and also uh, as of but I think that they are also able to type in the chat. So if you are in the lobby and would like to tell us something, uh, you can always type in the chat. However, if uh, if we are already, should we? Would you like to share a bit about the space, Kate and Sean? And we could maybe all come closer to the to the yellow tree. I think that uh, who is in the room is uh, all close. Maybe is Sean ready for this? Is it, hey, Judith, if I talk on Kate's, um, is that fine? Does that work for you? Yes, it's perfect. I muted your other uh, avatar. Okay. Um, so, yes, we're calling our scene Exiles. And um, we, I don't know, we started with uh, making a paper mache sculpture. And then kind of iterated out from that. We had a lot of different ideas, plan, original plan that we had to scrap because I'll let Sean explain more the, about the process. But um, it was really just the idea of, I mean, we both work pretty intuitively, like starting with a symbol that grabs us and just like making this sculpture, kind of intuitively feeling our way through how she should look and having ideas about, you know, these chakras, inserting objects in the chakras, and um, and then seeing what kind of arises as we're working, um, suggesting new directions and ideas. Um, I wanna let Sean tell more about how we did it, because he did most of the, the technical stuff. Um, I, I'm, I'm primarily a painter and I do make sculptures, so, you know, that was kind of my forte. Um, a lot of the kind of objects, 2D objects in the scene are taken cutouts from my drawings and paintings. Um, but Sean's more doing the modeling and digital stuff. So I don't know, Sean, do you want to talk about uh, sure. more about that? Yeah. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Sean. I'm, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so I, you know, I came to this, it's been kind of catapulted into the 3D world and into virtual reality from originally discovering just in, sort of accidentally that I could do 3D scans on my iPhone. And you, they have a LiDAR scanner and people have made apps. So you can scan real world objects and then digitize them in 3D and add their actual photo texture. And that, that kind of, without going too deep into that, uh, that brought me into showing these objects in augmented reality, and I was starting to post some things on Instagram where I would screen capture through the phone um, the camera view of moving through augmented reality in the real world. Um, but that led me into more into virtual uh, thinking virtually, and I discovered an app called Gravity Sketch, and everything changed with that because it's a, a very amazing, intuitive. 3D like combination of CAD and drawing app and there's you can import 3D objects and manipulate them even down to getting into the mesh and the nodes and changing textures and that sort of thing. So I was having a lot of fun with that and sort of discovering it and uh, this project came up. So uh, we to move forward a bit, we uh, we decided we wanted to start with a tangible object as almost like an orienting thing for us and maybe for the viewers. So we had the, the 3D or the paper mache figure, which we painted and uh, scanned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jean, right OK, we're just going to be I, I had to jump in because I just wanted to I just thought like I was super resistant to doing anything digital. 
because I hate working on the computer. So, you know, I was doing this on the, on the condition that I got to make something in real life to begin with. And I, I'm interested in just the aesthetic and kind of the concept of combining the material world and the sort of like digital world that feels more like the world of, I don't know, the spirits or imagination or something less tangible. So that's, that's kind of my in is with the, 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 the aesthetic of the digital combined with the material. So that's why we had to have an actual paper mache sculpture and go through all of the scanning and work that Sean had to do to make this thing readable here. Um, what we kind of stumbled into was that we could take the, we wanted to work from all these figures are a single, a single scan. And um, we worked to change the, the tones and the mapping and obviously all the adornment on the central figures, the small figures uh, was done in gravity sketch where you're just standing next to, you know, you can have a life size object next to you and draw hair onto them or uh, other elements, which is pretty amazing to do. The bigger fi figures were just, we took this surface texture, the skin, which was a photograph texture, and then realized we can just remap it with different photos and get strange effects. So there was a lot of playing around with that. And we gradually came to this sort of trinity of uh, uh, plant, you know, uh, animal, animal, vegetable and mineral. Yeah, right. And um, then the other issue was scale, like it, it we're, you know, we're learning as we go and realizing the effect you can have with scale. So we, we originally had the idea of just a gigantic figure that would be like its own landscape. Um, that we were going to have people explore and have all kinds of things going on inside its own world. But then we found that when we blew it up that big, it, it, for, it kind of like lost resolution. And then we had the, we had to pivot <laughs> and uh, do a bunch of smaller ones. And then it, I really like how this turned out though, having the smaller ones be more like material. You can see the like photographic texture of the paper mache. They're more lifelike. And then the giant ones, actually, the resolution looks better when uh, it's not, we're not trying to get photographic reality and it's all digitized. So, you know, this was the way that like the limitations of the, the materials we were working with kind of suggested a different conceptual direction, which we ended up really liking because these smaller figures seem more like, you know, the personal self, the individual, the separate selves you know, maybe the mortal self with these goddesses that, uh, you know, you can go inside and suggest maybe like, you know, some sort of like un archetypal universal selves or protectors or guardians or whatever, you know, I mean, everyone's interpretation or associations are um, um, valid. So, you know, um, go ahead, Sean. Oh, I, I, if you have more, because well, <laughs> no, yeah. I'm running, I'm running out. Yeah. I don't know. One of the, I, the, a fascinating thing about this for me is that it's so easy to change things and it's so easy to think fantastically, right? Because you can do things that you could never do. Like I worked in the actual world of sculpture and building and fabrication with doing ferro concrete sculptures. It could be like 25,000 pounds, you know, just gigantic, cumbersome things. And there's an enormous limitation and suddenly here it's like being superhuman. You can make a, a 300 foot tall giant just with the <laughs> scaling something up. Um, so it brought up a lot of questions for me about really uh, where do you want to, uh, how do you want to say like astonish people or disorient them and there were, where do you want to then uh, orient not just the viewer but yourself in this space. So there's a constant, still ongoing, like question and uh, ex exploration of that in my mind, um, and also uh, you, we found, especially collaboration, is you know it's a challenge in any case. You're mixing two sensibilities together, and uh, so there's a lot of give and take and uh, feeling things out. Then when you add in the ability to just pivot, you know, to use the, the word again, or uh, <laughs> keep changing things you really have to all right my experience was the challenge was to focus and actually stick to something 
uh, you, there's a fast learning curve. You're discovering new things. They're exciting. You want to include a lot of them. So it became an exercise of almost being reductive. And then there's a data limit. We were in horror of our data limit because we, mm-hmm. we kept reaching it and redlining everything. And um, so there are those kind of boundaries just like in the real world. And we're just getting used to them and figuring out where we, you know. Yeah. And, and, and what Sean had said something like, you know, with paint, like, you know, I'm normally just paint and with painting, it's like you get something visually spectacular and expansive and it's, it's very rare that that happens. But like Sean said that like the medium is so expansive that you have to be really reductive. So I think what we, what kind of, I don't know how we did that. Like what were, I don't even know like what our criteria were for no, not that, even though it's amazing to look at, not that it was kind of, I guess our concept of like, no, we're having a gathering of people and three goddesses. And Hmm. no Hmm. matter how (laughs) amazing this other tangent looks, it's not what's happening here and now. But there's a, Oh, go ahead. I, I just so appreciate all of what you said about how you have to focus on what the real meaning might be or where it lies, because it's, I think that these gatherings are exactly about how, how can you stay grounded. And um, I also um, wanted to just uh, like appreciate you, you talking about the way of creation, how uh, like, what is the shift in between material and what is how you shift in between or oscillate between realities and the process of how you built it in physical reality and then brought it into here, I think is exactly the kind of layering that probably has some potential to to bring soul or life or love or what you name it into these empty voids that is so expensive it's so uh, so easy to lose why we are here or what it means to be here and how to build this together right uh, so i so I, I just really like the, the patterns and like the, cre- the repetition of creation and how something becomes something. I would be really interested in how you, like I, I really love to hear how you just like focus on, okay, there is the three the goddesses and you have to like reduct to a point. And I would be interested in how you, like I, I really see how you are trying to make a, an emphasis, right? And to bring the power by the size and the scale and the enormous, with these enormous beings. And I would love to hear about what these three goddesses may carry, if you may, if you are uh, willing to talk about that. Oh, okay. Um. Yeah, let me, let me so what is up. the focus? Yeah, like what, like how do you envision, like when you bring these like three goddesses and let's say that you are creating a new layer of something um, and the hearts that are biting its, their own tails are paused and and it's the moment of what would be, what, what, are, your, what are the focus in the giants for you? Oh, you mean the objects in the giant? Or or your concept or like like what oh. is mm-hmm, like what the future goddess should bring us or uh, Right. Okay, you know. Do you want me to? Okay. So, if I the way that these things work for me, like I'll be working on a project and and it's sometimes when I like tap into some symbol, like powerful symbol, like this form or goddesses or, you know, um, then things in my life start relating to that. And I'll like just hear something or discover something that describes what is happening in the art. And I had that experience with this, um, listening to a talk with some, I don't know, contemplative teacher said something like, um, we have two versions of ourselves, the, um, the person we are to others and the person we are to ourselves. And the person we are to ourselves to others is a person and to ourselves, we are a container for the world. Wow. So, yeah. And so I was like, oh, wow, we have these contain these 
figures that are containers for all this other stuff that we wanted to put in them, but we didn't have room for, but so there's just some stuff in them, but they're empty containers for the world. And he talked about, you know, four stages of life. You begin as an infant where you are a container for the world, no sense of a separate personal self. You know, you evolve into a child and you are a little bit of both. You start to have an individual separate identity and start to see yourself the way people see you. As an adult, you pretty much go into you're a person for other people. You know, you, you kind of lose that childlike expanded consciousness of, you know, magic soul, whatever you want to call it. And then the final stage is the seer um, where you become a container for the world. You like transcend your personal self, but you also contain it as well. And he talked about this as like the individuation process of an individual, but also the collective civilization itself. And when we started as, you know, in participation mystique, you know, with no separate boundaries between ourselves and nature, animals, the land, each other. And, you know, he's, you know, talking about the future being we're evolve must evolve into understanding ourselves as containers for the world. Mm -hmm. And so for me, that really resonated with, the imagery and you know that we were working with here is that maybe these aren't even future goddesses but timeless goddesses that that we need to you know associate you know somehow you know evolve into a consciousness where we can embody the seer stage hmm. so I I would maybe this is a great curve to invite all the other avatar containers to to see if they would like to add into this what what they would like to share about this container <laughs> if if uh, if you feel comfortable sharing your thoughts about the space yeah we're really curious to hear other people I mean we have our you know I have my ideas that come with from my experience but I, we're very curious to hear uh, what other people other people's experience and, and associations with all of the, all of this. <laughs> and this is also the point I, and I also understand if, if, uh, if you don't feel comfortable speaking, that's also totally fine. Yeah. And no pressure. It's not a quiz. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I would love to hear about, uh, do you have a, uh, any significance to the numbers of, of the goddesses and the human scared figures? I, I can speak for me. I, I do not consciously have, I, like, I, the experience, my, my relationship to this is probably different than Kate's, but I've been awash in her symbol language for the, quite a while now, and uh, I've been fascinated by how she combines sort of very open channeling, almost like um, of uh, like languageless images and symbols, and then how they are also filtered through her mind, and she ends up with this symbol language in her paintings, right? Mm. And they're recurrent things that you form your own relationships with over time. And it's, I was very inspired by that. But where I'm coming to this uh, is more uh, almost like an act of faith that uh, if you open up and w stop naming things so much and stop... Uh, um, using discursive thought and articulating everything that these deeper sort of um, if you want to call them archetypal symbols or subconscious symbols and images and metaphors that I believe we probably primarily think in on some level will just emerge and they'll emerge in a natural order. Mm -hmm. This is the experiment at least. <laughs> so for me, it's been more one of um, floating things up and then as a secondary process, starting to let them speak to us and see if they then reveal to us mm -hmm. what in a conscious way what we're trying to do mm -hmm. subconsciously i don't yeah. know if that makes any sense or if that's too much but um that makes that i agree that makes sense and i mean that makes sense to me okay. <laughs> it, 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 but, uh, it makes sense to me too and i really appreciate you like how you phrased it it's so so beautiful i also find a very similar um process that you know when you look back your life and you see these little seeds i guess maybe seeds are also a good uh, good word to bring into 
what mm -hmm. are the seeds that these containers carry or what seeds are we in this space, right? And, and, you know, just to answer your question about the three, like, I mean, I, I kind of, I, I'm not like, I was, we were talking about this too. Like, I'm not super imaginative. I kind of just pick the obvious thing in front of me. Like three is the magic number. There's always three of everything in every fairy tale. Like, of course we would have three. And then we would have to have, you know, multiples of three for the giants. And we don't have enough data for 12. And six doesn't seem enough, so let's use nine. You know? Perfect. That's uh, I super love this answer. <laughs> so can you hear me? I can't tell. Yes. Anyway. We can oh, good. Okay. Sorry, I, I had to. I got some headset fatigue, so I switched to my desktop, and then I, you know. Sure. Anyway, mm -hmm. I just want to say this is for me. This is really inspiring, just because I'm. Um, kind of a newbie to 3D world building. Um, I've been using Unity and I, I guess I didn't really know fully what was possible to do in hubs, but also just the, the idea of populating the space with such a mix of, of these sculptures that have so much integrity, plus these like hand-drawn, you know, kind of water, watercolor. I, well, I don't know what material the tree is made out of, but it's, it just has this nice, um, you know, like you just kind of painted it, and then, did you yeah. paint it and scan it? I, I'm just, I might be asking like obvious questions, but no, 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 um, that's okay. um, yeah, mm -hmm. all of the cutout things, the little painted things, are just from paintings I had already done, and then just yeah, cutting them out and in Photoshop, and you know, and saving them as pings so that they can just be mass, have the background masked and put in here. Oh, fun! Great. Okay. That's that's what okay that's that's what I imagine. So right, just that, but just populating the v, the VR and three D space with this real mix of things. And then I, I've been reading the Hilda series with my five year old. So I, I was thinking about the. I don't know if you've read. They're just these little comic books. Hilda. I think there's like a cartoon too, but they're just these really beautiful. Uh, sort of like worlds within worlds within worlds, right? Like giants that are so giant that you might you know that you might not see them unless you actually change the scale of your body um so i think there's something so great about being uh in, in the 3d space and being able to fly and being able to get bigger and smaller and actually see the whole universe that was just satisfying so thank you i'm happy to finally be here <laughs> well, thank you thank you anna